African countries uh, they didn't take it that serious. I, I think um, you know they they have some parameters at yeah. which they operate with. They really want don't want to scare people at first. They thought it's something that would have been controlled. They thought it's something that wouldn't have spread because they wanted to this to point. It. Okay, you understand because when in, I remember that in December, sometimes right. in December, I think second week of December, that was when China started experiencing it. But nobody truly understands or knows the actual time right. when the um, 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 the the problem started in China. But with time, China came out and gave you know a public statement regarding that, and that was exactly when WHO got to know about you know the disease then now you can imagine the number of um chinese citizens that have traveled across different countries before it was even declared you know a pandemic before it was even announced in the first place so that goes to tell you the numbers of cases that we have discovered then even other um, nations who have traveled out of china from that time till now so uh, there's a lot of things that we don't really understand that is going on beneath and i just don't want to say this is another conspiracy theory to ensure that some pharmaceutical company somewhere will eventually emerge with vaccines and cure eventually and begin to rake in money most times these are the things that we get that know, plays out exactly the politics that plays out at the top there most especially um at who nobody wants to point accusing fingers right now but if you even look at the coronavirus itself a lot of people are saying different things how it was generated some are saying it was um genetically yeah. that, that's, you know, generated that's, that's, and all that's that that's the next question i was going to show to you the who uh did define the, the pandemic as a worldwide uh, disease which has a new disease which has affected the, uh, the globe that's yeah. its definition and uh, it's been said that this coronavirus uh this pandemic uh, has come from the animal influenza viruses. Uh, now that we know it's via an animal, what should those who are into uh, animal husbandry and other issues, health workers around that axis, uh, the, uh, those who butcher the meat and all those, how key are they now? What should the world be doing in order to uh, ensure that these things are stemmed right from the stables before it gets to the public you see first and foremost how do we consume these you know um, um animals oh. when they have been slaughtered if you look at a lot of video that have emerged from china you see that they eat almost everything raw and we've been told that okay. the virus cannot survive heat and if you look at it here in africa first the weather is favorable then secondly we almost cook everything we eat almost close to about 100 degrees centigrade you know so if you look at that maybe that's another factor that has actually played out for us because we are yet to get a case of a black man that is infected you know with this um, 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 pandemic the truth is if you look at the lifestyle of the chinese right. basically where it emanated from you can liken that to the fact that yes probably they were a bit careless with how they consume most of these products and all that so we, they, we really need to look at that then i know that in israel in france you eat almost everything raw you know they can serve you almost raw fish and all that so all these things can actually affect you know them and if you look at it italy has yeah, italy. you know one, one of the largest, yeah, the largest um, yes. number in europe so we need to look at it critically and investigate what what uh, mutation pattern right. does it take from the animal some people are saying it was genetically uh, um, produced, produced yeah. some people were saying yes it was introduced to control the world population that the target was targeted at the third world population but unfortunately almost every virus that had emanates actually from emanated from asia or in in europe had hardly have any effect in the african continent all right, uh, uh, let's now look at uh, the financial implications of uh, the COVID-19. And the sporting industry had a lot of matches, especially the UEFA Champions League, which is a big money speed uh, sporting event, uh, which a lot of club sites and UEFA, the governing body, make a lot of money from the gate takings uh, because you have loads of fans coming from different countries. 
uh, how does this affect uh, sports and other uh, economic sectors, especially uh, the Olympics, which is now also under threat of not holding? Yeah, uh, let's look at the financial implications. Of, there, there are a lot of financial. In fact, yesterday I was, I think I was somewhere. Then I just saw the news that the match between Arsenal and Man City have been cancelled. Yes, because some players were actually exposed to the Olympiacos oh. um, club owner. Owner, uh, you know. So if you look at it, has a massive impact, not just for the fans who go. Look at the television rights, look at the advertisement, look at the betting companies. Yeah. There's a whole lot of value chains that happen around the football industry. And if you liken that with what is currently happening, we are even heading for more disaster. Because even as of today, some matches have still been cancelled. And if it continues, in fact, as at the weekend, some matches were even played behind closed doors. No um, spectators were, were present. So globally, it's affecting a whole lot. Nigeria is going to, is estimated to lose close to about 2 trillion naira in the maritime industry already. And just so to say that we are even looking for more funds, dollar has, uh, um, crude the, 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 oil, crude oil price, know, has, price dropped. has dropped. So there is a whole lot of issues that is going to happen. Remember again, I said there might be artificial recession and that artificial recession is creeping in. We are beginning to notice, you know, economic downtown, uh, uh, downtime and all that. So if you look at even the stock exchange, all right. Nigeria has suffered downward. You know, a deep. Uh, exactly. There's a deep, there's a, there's a lot of deep in most of the uh, stock Production. exchange okay. that we have. So in times of finances, it is already on record that money is being lost and is going to be, we are going to lose more if we don't really control you know this court. and you know initially some some analysts were saying that because the chinese economy was overtaking not just the u.s but the world economy so they're trying to slow it down yeah they're trying to slow it down but unfortunately it has affected the global economy and whether we like it or not if this trend continues to like the end of this month we are going to begin to have recession in some continent and even in some country as the case may be. All right, uh, before we leave the economic uh, part of it, uh, let's narrow it really down to Nigeria. We, we, we've been told by the Minister of Finance, um, Budget and National Planning, uh, that Nigeria is going to review its budget for 2020 and if possible, uh, see how complementary budget or could be brought in. How does that affect what Nigeria had, you know, a marked to gain in terms of infrastructure development and and the huge amount of the 2020 budget now suffering the fate of lack of finance to you know push through uh, whatever the government had as plans how does this affect us it will affect us um um, um very very it, in fact is a low blue okay to us because if you look at it even the the then um um crude, crude yeah. you know that they peg for like 60 to 65 dollars you know per barrel has or has its own impact already because i don't think the government would have been able to finance the budget right. you know using that benchmark but having this crisis right now even cutting it down to as low as 30 to 35 dollars we have a huge huge problem in our hands remember you know i've always said that we've run a deficit budgeting budget, yeah. and if you run a deficit budgeting you are running almost a welfare state because most of the activities that you see, the conditional cash transfer, the market yes. money, all of them are, you know, welfareist in nature. And you need much more money to push into the system to be able to sustain the temple. All right. You know, I talked about sustainability sometimes back. Yeah. Now come to infrastructure. We want, if you go almost to our roads right now, you know, roads are being constructed and work is going on. But they really need to finance this process because it's going to create jobs, you know, for people at the lowest of the bottom of the pyramid and go to the agricultural sector for instance that's the reason why we've always said that the um we do always need to have a, a plan b and the plan b has always been there for us but it's like we are yet to tap in what has always been the plan b is for us to look inward and integrate the informal sector to the formal sector because this is where the largest of the nigeria economy plays out on a daily basis but it doesn't actually add up to the gdp because you don't have any in, um, data index right. to analyze and look at the performance index rate at which we are all performing economically so it is time for not just the 
tax sector, like FIRS, for right. instance, even Pencon, even the insurance company, you need to come with a lot of micro products that will cushion the effects. From there, when there's a lot of activity going on, I will give you an example. For instance, you have the conditional cash transfer. All right. so you have the uh, trader money that is being paid through cash. And we also have a government that is calling for financial inclusion strategy. Now, you have a wallet system already in place because you've licensed a lot of companies to carry out mobile money activities. Yet, you are not driving that process for them. What one would have thought is most of these conditional cash transfer, most of these palliative measures that the government has introduced for you know welfare state would have passed through the wallet system because okay. when they purchase airtime, there is VAT that you get. When they purchase, when they do transfer, you get you know uh, uh, your money from there. Right. Whatever activity that is done on the platform, the economy is thriving. And you will reduce inflation because your money will not be devalued. You will not have inflation in the system because money is in circulation. But if you have this concept in place, you will be able to, you know, cushion the economic effect and oscillate it to ensure that we make up for exactly what the, the gap that we are having at the moment. So the best way to go is to look informally and also concentrate more on the agricultural value chain. We have a lot of raw materials that we just export out of the country, but we don't process. And if you look at countries like Ethiopia, Rwanda, most of them have deep-rooted industries. And no nation, quote me, no nation can thrive without strong policy on industrialization. All right. Uh, before, uh, looking at, uh, you made mention of VAT. Uh, we know that recently the federal government did increase it uh, to 7.5%. Yeah. Uh, looking at what's happening globally now, should, not, should there be a reversal of that decision? Yeah. Already, even when it was at 5%, we have apathy. In terms of compliance. In terms of compliance. All right. And the compliance rate is almost like very abysmal because we know in Lagos there were uh, over one point something registered exactly uh, taxpayers but exactly a minimum of four hundred thousand were the only ones paying. paying. So compliance rate is almost you know not working. Not so what we need to do is the concept of deduct at source, which is exactly what the ordinarily the VAT would have introduced because okay. VAT is actually born out of the last consumer. Okay. You know, sometimes you even pay it, you don't know. A lot of people go into a store, you know, you just see VAT. You don't really know what that, you know, entails. Okay. But okay. the truth is, the common man on the street might not pay directly, but they pay indirectly. Because the value chain that occurs within the transport system, where they transport their goods, you know, to markets and all that, all these, you know, levies that they pay informally actually affect them to some extent. So it, that's why I said, Instead of over concentrating on collecting VAT, and even if you increase VAT to 50%, you will still not have the ripple effect you want to have. But if you concentrate more in the informal sector, you're going to have a much multiplier effect because you are not just adding value to the economy, you are just not collecting. You will also have a productive and a progressive plan to give back to those you are collecting for a benefit that right. will be meaningful to them. When I know that I've, I've entered the tax net and I'm seeing the different, you know, programs that the government has introduced, you know, I know now that I can assess healthcare delivery system in my community. I know that me as a trader here in Abuja and my families are in Kano, you know, I don't necessarily need to travel. All I need to do is to give them my social insurance number and they go to the healthcare delivery system there or center in Kano and they get easy healthcare delivery system. So if I have that and you are asking me to pay tax, I'll be willing to pay. And trust me, Nigerians actually comply. When they know that they are paying for the, to the right channel, they will definitely comply. All right, uh, enough of uh, uh, the issue of uh, COVID-19 and the implications of what we are likely uh, to suffer. We'll be going for a quick break. When we come back, we'll be delving into the second header uh, issue we're looking at uh, recently, the Nigerian Senate. Uh, the senator representing Niger uh, State uh, did come up with a bill to ban the importation of generator sets in Nigeria. And that's going to be our next focus after the break. Stay with us.
athletics, gymnastics, just name it. I love sports. Yes! 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 I am a woman. I deserve to be seen, heard, and be happy. <laughs> Future, I love cartoons. And the future, I love education. That's why I'm here. I'm a cousin. I'm a lecturer. I'm a teacher. 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 And to achieve this, I do it with no other than liberty team. And the future, I am liberty! Liberty TV. Voice for all, vision for all. Welcome back. You're watching Liberty Television flagship program Dialogue. And on today's edition, we're looking at uh, the final declaration by the WHO uh, saying COVID 19 is now officially a pandemic, as it's been recorded in 114 countries with a total of 1,429 uh, deaths already globally. All right, uh, it's now time for us to focus back on the biggest black nation, Nigeria, and the recent. Uh, uh, bill which was uh, being initiated by niger south uh, senator representing niger south in the person of bima uh, in nagi uh, which introduced the bill that seeks to ban the importation of generator sets in the country it's tied to the bill is tied to a bill of an act to prohibit to ban the importation of generating sets to curb menace of environmental pollution and facilitate the development of that sector uh, looking at how it sounds really nice, uh, it be able to prohibit the ban of importation and also help the environment. Uh, so says uh, uh, the Senator uh, Bima Inagi from uh, the Niger South. Uh, the big question is, is Nigeria ready to live without the generator sets? And is it because the elites, the politicians, they all have generator sets already in their houses? So. Uh, they can easily say let's ban importation of new generator sets. Uh, very disturbing is the comment of Fanny Femi Kayode. Uh, he said the, the senator, talking about uh, Bima Inagi, deserves to be tied up, <laughs> put in a street jacket, uh, put in a sack with lots of weight inside, and taken to the deepest part of the Atlantic Ocean and allow him to sink to death. Does that describe? what nigerians feel as regards this bill mm, I, I think that is going through extreme you know from the comment that um gani uh, gani kaudi fanny kaudi you know passed <clears throat> i remember it was once time a minister of aviation yes he was. and then um, we all know the kind of corrupt you know practices that you know went down nigerians are we are fresh with that memory so if you it's easier when you are a spectator actually to criticize you know but it's more difficult when you are in the field playing you know that it's very very difficult you know how long the Ex exactly is. and the length of time 90 minutes can be very short but it can be very very long when you're in the pitch so it's easier for him to to make that kind of comment but for me i feel it's too extreme for if a civilized human being to make yes you can make your opinion you know felt by you know critiquing rather than criticizing I would like to look at you know that comment the senator made from a, uh, from a different perspective. Right. First, there is a positive part to it, and yes. there is a negative part to it. Let's go with the positive. Yeah, the positive is if that happens, that means that there is going to be a lot of pressure on those who are saddled with the responsibility of giving us constant electricity to ensure that they do that almost immediately. Right. But one thing that you will want to ask yourself is how realistic exactly. is that? Because um, we know that. 50% of the Nigeria economy is run through generator, 
And um, if you don't have an alternative source of generating uh, your own power, you know, the economy will even cripple because most of the little industry we have that even existing in Nigeria currently run on that. And um, for him to come out and make such statement, I would have ordinarily think that he would have pegged it to say um, we are giving those responsible to give us um, electricity. They promised actually that by 2020, we're going to get 10,000 megawatts yeah. and 10,000 megawatts is huge to actually go through the system and to give us constant electricity, if not 80, but 90 percent, as the case may be. So one would have thought that he would have, you know, you know, given us a bill that will give them an automaton right. for, for, for those consigned, the stakeholders, right. Minister of Power, and yeah, everybody to give us stable yeah. electricity. You know, and meter the unmetered. Right. You know, that is exactly what I would, one would have thought. But the negative aspect is, I've mentioned part of it. If you, you know, remove, the, uh, if you ban it, even those that already have, some, I know some people who almost every year change their generator set because they just want something new. You know, they don't want any kind of, you know, something hitch. Very efficient. Exactly. Right. Something very efficient that will keep them going. So even if it's banned now, most of them will still cry foul because a lot of them want to replace the old ones and a lot of something can happen. For instance, maybe you bring in a technician and he, he spoils your generator said you want to replace it you know, rather than keep changing. So, but that aside, the truth is, the question again will be, is Nigeria really ready okay. for, for, you know, banding uh, uh, um, uh, electrical generator. I don't think we are ready for that. Uh, if you put into context the fact that the Senate President Ahmed Lawan did come out to say uh, that the whole power sector was a hoax, uh, the, the selling privatization process was all fraud and had called on Mr. President to declare state of emergency and said everything needed to be overhauled in the power sector. Uh, and now you bring this into bill. Can we see our senators are probably confused or probably do not have the interest of the masses at heart? Because if at one hand you're saying uh, the whole sector is a corrupt mess that needs overhauling, and you're also saying the only way Nigerians can get power supply should be stopped. And also add into that context the fact that 10 years imprisonment for whoever is found selling generator sets. What does this do to the economy and the whole process? You see, again, that goes to show you the kind of criticism that the current Senate, even the National Assembly, had, you know, witnessed uh, so far. I, I know that um, there is a delegation that is about to travel, had even traveled to meet with Siemens for, for them to look at how they can come in, right. you know, to solve the power problem. So already the federal government is making an effort, you know, in that perspective because they don't want to, you know, clear them off and you don't have an alternative. alternative. So they're already thinking ahead. So I want to believe that that solution they are providing will definitely be a lasting solution and sustainable one at that. And uh, for the senators, you see, it's sad when we continue to criticize and criticize them because even you get tired criticizing them because most of the things that are on the front burner that they're supposed to discuss about, we have the insecurity in the country where I feel they should have passed a law to say that if any Nigerian dies, we must investigate the cause of that death, not even an invasion of Boko Haram, bandit, or even kidnappers picking people. You pass that bill that you're going to hold security apparatus responsible, even if it's a madman that dies, you want to know the detail of what happened to the person. Because when sometimes you know, I sit down and I do a deep thinking in the sense that you tell us that you have cap, uh, you have um, arrested some kidnappers. You drill down and ask questions. You drill down and investigate. Now, do you want to say that you cannot trace the source of their being? You cannot trace the source of them getting weapons, financial. the financial aid, and all the people that are involved in these different steps of the value chain of these criminal acts are supposed to be brought to the fore. So because if they are brought to the fore, those who are thinking or who are still existing perpetrating such acts, will this will serve like uh, as a deterrent 
to them in even going further in doing this. so the senate needs to really sit up tight and ensure that they look at things that will benefit the common man on the street because the truth is the rate of unemployment in nigeria both in the skilled and unskilled labor is very very alarming i traveled over the weekend and the construction that is taking place between the road construction that's between kano and abuja all right there's these um concrete um, um tarmacs that are kept you could see youth under scorching sun with big hammers you know breaking through these stones and removing metal for them to go sell now the question is when they finish breaking all this and they don't find anything else to sell and you could see them these are um, youth full with energy these are youth who would have used productively into the economy these are youths that are hungry to work you can see that they are even making effort they want to work so we, but we don't have a system whereby we can integrate them for instance i talked about industrialization earlier imagine that you have a lot of thriving industries in the country most of these youths would have been absorbed they would have gotten some kind of skills you know one way or the other look at uh, but is it botswana or burkina faso one of these countries tanzania, tanzania exporting meat out of africa to europe and china and we have look at the value chain we have in our cattle business here in nigeria but we are here to announce that it's a huge potential and given the fact that the north has the largest concentration of um, the, the 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 product you would have ordinarily thought that we could actually package this but then again you cannot sustain the business if you don't have stable electricity because you need to ice right. it you know you need to from storage. the exactly you need to store it from the point of you know slaughtering from the point of packaging from the point of reserving and from the point of even you know transport right. transporting them to 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 to, to the port right. all right uh, let's look at uh, still looking at uh, the ban uh it's been said 10 years should be uh, the jail term for anyone who who is found knowingly or knowingly selling generator sets uh looking at the the the, the time for this uh to, to be served if you're found guilty and you 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 look at it by pursue uh, other j terms for corruption and other issues of national interest don't you think the senate is always lopsided uh, you see uh, like i said it's sad that we are having this set of um, human beings you know in, in, in the, sometimes you begin to wonder if they are nigerians because um i believe that right from the foundation of this country there was what we call the national interest now national interest the self-interest has, has, taken over. has taken over the national interest and when you have a country where self-interest has overtaken the national interest, you have a crisis in your hands. Because what everybody is thinking of is myself, me, myself, and I, and my family. And when you have that, you will understand the kind of mindset. In fact, my dealings with a lot of people from the past eight to nine months gives me serious, serious source of concern. Because almost everywhere you go to in this country you no matter how beautiful your idea is no matter how beautiful your solution is what they ask you is what is the need for me it's sad it's it's like as if it's in the nigerian dna so it's in our blood everybody is looking at what they are going to get and that's the same mindset that you have with our lawmakers without prejudice that is the same mindset if any of them can come out and authoritatively come out to tell you that they don't serve, they don't go for self-interest, they are lying. So can we say the corruption war by uh, waged by President Muhammad Buhari, who is also the champion of corruption fighting the African continent, is totally a, is just lip service and the, his administration was supposed to be the most transparent administration? Yeah, you see, I don't really envy him. I won't lie to you. I don't want to condemn Nigerians, but if you know the terrible things that goes on, even those that are not in power, that would tell you the extent at which corruption has eaten deeply into the fiber of our economy. I don't envy the president because the truth is, in all fairness to him, the president cannot be everywhere. Obviously. He can't be everywhere. And those he has, he has deep you know, trust for, that he has brought to work with him, 
even if he hears that they have corrupt allegations against them, he can he, 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 he can break his heart. So now he will begin to wonder: Will I go and bring people from Nigeria Republic, or will I go and bring people from Benin Republic, or will I import people to come and work for me? I will still need, he still needs to work with Nigerians, but the same Nigerians are the same people who are amongst those that he has entrusted with the economy of this country. Yet you will see traces of corruption in one or two of their dealings. That is the reason you see that if Nigeria signs any agreement with a multinational, look at that agreement. You will see that Nigeria is always at disadvantage. Why? Because one person or two people Shut have in the country. compromised. So we need to really emphasize the concept of self-interest. We really need to begin to build that again in us. Because if we don't, like I said, the crisis, the army of unemployed youths that we have currently in this country is massive and it can consume us. Now, there's a piece I'm working on called the unconscious elite. All right. The truth is, both of us here are unconscious elites. Yeah, we might say, yes, um, we are not at the top there, but the truth is the common man on the street does not see you. He sees you with a tie and a suit. He sees you drive a car, even if you drive a rickety car. He doesn't care in as much as you belong to that cadre. You belong and you've begun to school and he sees you on the street every day. You live differently. Your kids go to a private school, not a public school. You are part of the unconscious elite. So we have a danger that is currently, you know, before uh, facing us. And if we don't treat that and we look at it, that is the truth is. For our, our, our leaders to have a change of mindset, we need to push that ideology to them. Because we too are the receiving end. Before they can get to them, they'll get to you. That's the truth. Very worrisome there. All right, uh, still looking at uh, the band, uh, some of the positives of the band. It said that uh, uh, those who use it for medical purposes, the airports, the railway stations, uh, elevators, escalators, and research institutions, facilities, uh, would not... Uh, face that uh, issue of the ban. My question is, uh, we know that hospitals, medical, uh, most hospitals we have in Nigeria, it's, it's, it's the private owned ones that are very functional. Effective. How can we differentiate when one is uh, using strictly for medical purposes or because we know some hospitals that have each residential and, yeah, yes. around there. The truth, I was smiling when you were talking. They've already created a loophole, even okay. if you want this <laughs> bill to pass. pass. Because for instance, I have a friend who has an hospital, for instance. I don't really need to go. All I need to tell him is that part of your order that is coming, I want to place my own order under it. Then you begin to see a, a surge of uh, people, you know, <laughs> placing demand <laughs> on <laughs> most of all these people that have been exempted. <laughs> and Nigerians are definitely going to cow in, uh, cash in okay. on it. All right, uh, on that note, I will be calling to wrap on the program Dialogue on Liberty Television. My guest has been super fantastic. His name is Issa Ali Shatter, one of Nigeria's finance uh, uh, current affairs analysts, and also he's into uh, mobile money matters, so you can reach out to him when you need some help. All right, I want to say thank you, Ali uh, Shatter, for being in the studios. Thank you very much for having me. All right, uh, special thanks to you at home for always being part of Liberty Television, and special thanks to the entire production team, Karim, uh, Kainde, and everybody else, uh, Titus, uh, Musa, and also Ella, for everybody who made this program come out amazing. Thank you very much. My name is Anthony Momodu saying, uh, wishing you a very pleasant Thursday and hoping that all you've gotten today, this morning, you're going to put it in good use. And especially to our senators out there, make sure you make policies for the good of the country and not for yourself. This is how I say goodbye and wish you a very lovely day ahead. <laughs>